at you know how often that can be the case in a, in a locker room or you have certain guys who are just haven't figured it out. I feel. Oops, I accidentally cut that sound bite short, but that's okay. We're here. That was Kirk Cousins saying that there's there's no uh, there's no problems in the locker. I thought room. it was my headphones for a second. No, it was just me, my fat fingers clicking the wrong button. Um, basically, the summary is: Hey, we're not totally screwed yet, even though we're one and four. We don't have a bunch of bad apples in the locker room, and so we're going to try and get this thing figured out. And then I think he ended it by saying, "You like that? You like that? Football." Uh, I'm Phil Mackey. That is Judd Zolgad. We've got Declan Goff producing on Purple Daily. And if you're new to Purple Daily, A, thank you for discovering either our podcast on Apple, Spotify, and scorenorth.com or on our YouTube page, which just went over 10,000 subscribers, youtube.com slash Purple Daily Podcast. You can just click that subscribe button, support the show, and um, yeah, you can listen to us banter seven days a week about this one in four football team. And every Wednesday, we do two things. We do our pigskin pecking order. And we also do a deep dive into the state of Kirk Cousins, the most impactful, important player. And this deep dive is always powered by our friends at Corona Hard Seltzer for sparkling flavors. Um, and so I have some speculation, actually, for you guys. Ooh, I think I know what it, this I think I saw particular this. deep dive. Yep. Yep. Reckless speculation. Because just to frame this up, We've done so many Kirk Cousins deep dives and, and you know, we've, we've been hard on him and we've had some back and forth with Vikings fans that are still in on Kirk Cousins. Um, I want to do two things with you guys. I want to first just sort of frame up his first five games statistically, and then I want to go down a speculative path. Okay. All right. Let's first frame up the season here. So, Statistically, Kirk Cousins is having the worst season of his career as a starting quarterback. Now, that is not to say that he is the only problem. I feel like every time we we go down a path like this, it's like, well, you know, why don't you talk about the right guard? Drew Samia is having a worse season than Kirk Cousins is. So we're not. This is an episode about Kirk Cousins, and he is having statistically the worst season of his career as a starting quarterback. 21st in adjusted completion percentage, 24th in traditional passer rating. 25th in QBR, which is ESPN's passer rating with context. Like if it's third and 15 and you complete a 10-year pass, you don't get as much credit. 23rd in adjusted net yards per attempt. He already has more interceptions this season than all of last season. It is worth noting that Pro Football Focus has him still as a top 10 quarterback, placing more blame on the offensive line than some of these other measurements do. Uh, but it's also worth noting that Kirk Cousins is now 45, 46, and 2 all time. As a starting quarterback, he is almost 100 games into his career as a starter, and he is basically exactly a 500 guy. So I think there's a lot of Vikings fans who are wondering, A, what are the alternatives going forward? And we've talked about a lot of those, but I have another one for you. And B, something Judd broached in our emails last night. What if the Vikings had chosen a different path three years ago? Like, what would like would it have played out differently with the different doors that they could have gone into? But I want to start you guys with the first one of those, which is the alternative options going forward, because there's one that we should circle back on from an article and a discussion that uh, that, that an NFL general manager had on Golik and Wingo two and a half years ago. If you could hit the speculation button one more time for me. Here, Dad, okay? Reckless speculation. Did you guys notice what happened in the 49ers game on Sunday? Yes. Yeah. Jimmy Garoppolo got benched. Yes, he did. And it wasn't, as far as we know, it wasn't injury related, right? No, he came back healthy. They tried to say it was. They they benched okay. him at the halftime and said he couldn't adequately protect his ankle. But the problem mm. is he wasn't on the injury report, which he was supposed to be. So there's a lot of speculation about what the what the real benching was for. So, okay, maybe he's still kind of hurt. But he also was was put in bubble wrap for what three playoff games in which like they basically just didn't trust him to throw the ball in big playoff games. Yeah. He tried to give that game away in the first half against the Vikings. So there's already a, a stench in San Francisco of, ah, this isn't really working with Jimmy Garoppolo. We got a great roster. And then he gets benched in this game. Here is a story from the Washington post in March of 2018, pulling quotes from an ESPN radio interview during an interview with Golik and Wingo. Niners general manager John Lynch confirmed what many had assumed. 
even though the 49ers inked Jimmy Garoppolo to a massive contract extension, Kyle Shanahan always really, really, really wanted Kirk Cousins. Quote from John Lynch. For Shanahan, I think the thing I would tell people is, we made the trade, but then there were some days that Kyle Shanahan was like in mourning because I think everybody knows his master plan was to have Kirk Cousins come in eventually. I was proud of Kyle because I think he knew that this was going to be the right thing for our franchise and he didn't hesitate. But then, even then, Jimmy had to really prove himself. Kyle, I think, was really smart. He didn't play him right away. He wanted he wanted to wait until there was a semblance of understanding our scheme. And when he did put Jimmy in, he put him in in a position to succeed. But ultimately, just to sum this quote up, Kyle Shanahan was apparently super, super sad that Kirk Cousins wasn't no, wasn't available because he signed with the Vikings. So Jimmy has two years and $54 million left on his contract, but the guaranteed money runs out after this year, basically. Like, I think his dead cap is like $2 million or something for next year. Would there be an opportunity to make a straight-up swap here? If Kyle Shanahan feels like Jimmy G's not the guy, I love Kirk Cousins, I loved our time together in Washington. Would there be an opportunity for a straight up swap cousins for Jimmy G? Maybe there's another like late round pick exchanged or something. The Vikings then have Jimmy Garoppolo to take a look at at $27 million a year next year and the year after, but no guarantees. And then they can draft a quarterback if they want to in the first or second round and have both Jimmy Garoppolo as the, well, we'll give you a little flyer here and the, the quarterback in waiting. What do you guys think of that premise? Do you think it's realistic? Do you think it's well pie in the sky? I wouldn't worry about Garoppolo. So if if I'm the Vikings and the Niners come to me and say, we've soured on our guy and Kyle is crying in the corner and is pining for Kirk, I would say, that's fine. Here's the interesting thing about that. So in 2021, post June 1st, if you were to trade Kirk Cousins, the dead money on your cap would be so post June 1st of of next year would yeah. be 10 million with a cap savings of 21. So I wouldn't even concern myself with Garoppolo. You have to eat it all for 2021 and you're right. talking about 2022 money there, right? But but what I'm saying is if you decided that Kirk was just not the guy, which I don't think the Vikings would do, but if you did that, there would be a plausible way to just basically say we're going to draft a quarterback. We're going to take our lumps and trade him now and get out of the contract as, well, it's not painless. With some pain, the problem is, is Spielman going to admit to the Wilfs that he screwed the pooch on this one, which would that that would be tantamount to doing. But um, yeah, because this comes back to the question I, th- I was th- thinking of the last couple of days, which is what if you, you had gone... If you were uh, Rick and Brzezinski and you had gone to the Wolves last March and said, we are in cap hell, we have, you know, we've tried, we put together what we thought was a good team. It's not working and we could get out of cap hell by extending Kirk, but we're not going to like we, our advice is, is let's take our lumps now uh, because Kirk is not the guy in that in the last couple of years has been determined and they're taking their lumps even with that's the extension. my point like that's my point so the next so the next the, the next logical jumping off point of that discussion if you can put your ego aside which is going to be tough to do is to trade him post june 1st of 2021 you take lumps it's not as bad as what you would take right now and i don't even care about garoppolo it would allow you to move on so let's go back to the it's thing plausible. you said about, about Rick Spielman for a second here, because there's a lot of ego tied up here and like, this is my team and this is the quarterback that we signed. And, and he's then, the, his guy. Right? Yeah. But I don't necessarily think you have to admit a failure or a mistake. If you admit that you want a different quarterback beyond 2020, if you're Rick Spielman, because I think you can make, and we'll go through some of these other options about like if they had chosen an alternative path in 2018, in 2018, the Vikings decided we have a win now Super Bowl window. We want to keep that window open. And we feel like Kirk Cousins helps us keep that window open. And those are all accurate things. Like we can sit here and debate, well, what if they had kept Keenum? And we'll do that in a second. But I think it's fair to say that in the moment, it was the right move to make to bring in Kirk Cousins. See if you can elevate him a notch or two from what he was in Washington with a good roster around him. And then I think it's also the correct thing to say a few years later that, all right, like we haven't been a disaster until this year so far. 
But um, things have kind of changed. Circumstances have changed. The roster has turned over because that's what happens in the NFL. And based on our current situation, we need to move on from Kirk because of these two quarterbacks or these four quarterbacks in the draft or this guy that became available via trade. I don't think you. I don't think it's just like oh, it's a failure if you didn't win a Super Bowl with Kirk. I think it's oh, it was the right move three years ago, and now the right move could be to move off of him to go find something else that's not thirty three million dollars. What makes it more di- the discussion more difficult at this point in time though is not the original contract, which I think we all said okay, cool. It's the extension. It's the fact that you went back to, to the Wilfs in March and said, we are going to get ourselves out of cap hell and here's how, and we're going to extend Kirk again. So if this was still, if this was the original contract, I think this conversation can be had and shouldn't be that that hard. It just didn't work. This is the final but year you of took a three-year guarantee. But you contract. took a swing. Good for you. Um, the problem is you went back to them in March and did this and tied your, yourself up cap-wise for the future more. And do you now have the intestinal fortitude to go to the people that own the team and say, you know what I told you last March? Yeah, I'm I'm off that. Yeah. Now, on one Should hand, they? Absolutely consider it, yes. On one hand, they got unlucky because COVID hits, so they restructure Kirk. COVID hits. They signed Michael Pierce, but then Michael... So they basically signed Michael Pierce with the money that they saved to the cap by extending Kirk Cousins, reducing his cap number for this year, and smoothing it out over future years, right? Mm-hmm. That move allowed them a win now signing. And then they got unlucky because COVID hits and Michael Pierce says, I am high risk. I'm going to opt out of this thing. So, so keep that in mind. When I ask the question, how big of a mistake was it? And how big, how badly did the Vikings front office misjudge what this year's team was capable of by saying, let's take some of these Kirk guaranteed dollars, move them into the future. Thus like put, you know, making him the starting quarterback for, a fourth and a fifth year effectively. Right. Because if we do that, we can lower his cap for this year and have a more competitive team. Right. And keep our window open for 2020. How badly did they misread that? And how rippable is that? Knowing that they got unlucky with Michael Pierce. I think the cousins equation is rippable based on the fact that we had all seen enough to know what what he's capable of doing. And if your ultimate goal by now was not to win a Super Bowl, but just to maintain being good. I don't like that. On defense, though, that would be my excuse. I would say, look, Daniil Hunter got hurt. Not my fault, okay? I mean, the guy is not going to play almost certainly in 2020. Pierce, to your point, Phil, opts out, right? The cornerbacks, you rolled the dice, and it's not that they're bad, but it's going to take time. So I would actually, if I was to go to the Wilfs and I was Rick uh, or Mike or Rob and I I was to make the case about why I think it's time to possibly dump Kirk I would say based on circumstances that went beyond our control as well we are not going to be as good as we thought not even close probably and therefore I think the one thing now and this is the most important thing is can I sell the Wilfs and is there a path here for me to draft the quarterback that I want to? Because if I'm going to, like, if I win eight games, seven games, and now I'm going into the draft and I'm like picking, you know, 13th or something like that, then it might be tougher. But if I'm just bad and look, it's all gone to hell and I win four games, okay? But I can give them a path to here's our quarterback of the future. He's a five-year contract guy and we can go sign guys. And and now we've got cap space. I think what you need to do is convince the Wilfs that you have the opportunity here to hit a reset button that you didn't see coming and isn't necessarily all your fault. Cause yeah. that's true. Yeah. And like th- things change so fast in the NFL that a decision you made three years ago, the landscape around it changes. So that's where I'm, I'm I don't think, I don't think you have to just be like admitting that you're a failure as a GM because you want to move off cousins. Like you made an aggressive move. You signed up. And quite frankly, the Vikings should be lauded for making aggressive free agency moves, which they have under the Wilfs. Yeah. The last 15 years, but back to this 49ers angle for a second. Mm-hmm. So I, I had it in my mind sort of that like, well, they'd want to the Niners, the, the Niners would probably um, they'd want to move Jimmy Garoppolo's money out. Well, they can just cut Jimmy Garoppolo right. regardless anyways. Yeah. So it would really be up to the Vikings if they wanted to test drive Jimmy Garoppolo. But if they wanted to, they probably wouldn't pay the $27 million because there's no reason to. Correct. They could just get him on the open market for less money or something, right? So so throw that angle out and let's just talk about, 
Forget about Jimmy G for a second. Let's say the Niners have moved on from Jimmy G and they need a new quarterback in a win now Super Bowl window. What do you think their level of interest would be if you picked up the phone and said, John Lynch, Kyle, we have moved off Kirk Cousins. We're not just going to give him away. And really, we're not we're not even going to cut him. Like we could still start him in 2021, but just know that his time with the Vikings is now borrowed, and we're looking to get a young quarterback and just kind of go into the next mode. But we would trade him to you if you had interest. What do you think their interest level would be? And what do you think the Vikings could get for Kirk Cousins? Shanahan's would be incredibly high because I really do think that that's his guy. John Lynch is a wild card here. I don't know how, how much Lynch and Shanahan are on the same page, too, because it was Lynch who really was trying to get Brady. And Kyle's been like, oh, but I love Kirk, okay? Um, but I think I think if Kyle... That's amazing, by the way. <laughs> Let's bring Tom Brady in. I don't know. I'm kind of got to think for Kirk Cousins. Kirk. <laughs> well, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Kyle thinks that the corporate QB for him would be absolutely perfect because he can basically puppet string his ass up and down the field and win games. It's probably not true, but it's how Kyle thinks. So I think the Niners probably would give you, for Kirk Cousins, a mid-round draft pick. And you probably take it and run, and right? And maybe like a fourth and seventh. Yeah, you take that and you a run A fifth with and sixth. It. Mm-hmm. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, this is about this is about getting rid of the contract. This is this has nothing to do with the return. And no, he, if you if you would give me a fifth and a seventh, I'd probably take that. And here's the other thing too about the contract. It's it's all sort of what's your situation, what's your roster look like, where are you in the winning cycle? Kirk's contract, when I look at the Vikings, is a disaster because you basically have to guarantee him unless unless you eat 2021 and part of 2022 by cutting him before the league year starts in March. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you can just like get out with only 45 million guaranteed after 2020. If you hang on to him after the league year starts, you are now triggering the contract for 2022, as I understand it. And so you have to make a decision on Kirk Cousins basically in the next five months. Do you want him to be eating up money on your roster in 2022? And you can double check that real quick. Mm-hmm. So, so in, in, a, in, a, in a time period where I personally would advise the Vikings to draft a quarterback in 2021 and get on with the next evolution of, of quarterbacks, the 49ers might look at that contract and say, oh, we only have to commit to two years. Yeah, let's take a flyer on it. We got two more years left in this window. Mm-hmm. Like they would probably look at it and say, that's not that long of a commitment. That's less than the Vikings committed to when they signed him in 2018. That was a three-year $84 million ironclad guarantee deal with, with I think some bonuses for like peak performance. So, um, so while that contract looks like an albatross, if you're, if you're interested in drafting a quarterback in 2021, um, the Niners might look at it and say, All right, yeah, we'll give you a pick for that Co- couple year flyer on, on a guy that Kyle Shanahan loves. So here, here's the terms of, of the contract and the stipulations about what the Vikings would have to do to cut him. If cousins is on the Vikings roster on the third day of the 2021 league year, so middle of March his 2022 salary, which is currently guaranteed for injury will become fully guaranteed. Now here's the problem. Yeah. So That's a $45 million cap hit. Exa- exactly right. But look at what I'm talking about, which is the potential post June 1st trade of Kirk. And it goes down to 10 million, which I can absorb and handle. Like it's not perfect, but I can do it. So which, uh, so you're saying, let's say they agree. In so principle, I'm saying they agree in principle up, to a trade in, in March, yeah. but they don't pull the trigger on it till after June. Exactly. How much would the Vikings? So the Vikings then would get rid of Kirk and the Niners can cut Jimmy at any time. I don't care about that. Yep. So even if the Vikings trade Kirk after June 1st, it becomes official, let's say. This mm-hmm. happens all the time. We're like, we agree to a trade, but we can't actually pull the trigger until this date. It's happened quite a bit, yes. They would still owe money. How much would they owe? Ten, uh, if they traded them post-June 1st to San Francisco of 2021, they would have dead money of $10 million and they would have a cap savings of $21 million. And that's just for 2021? And that's for 21. And then they wouldn't owe anything for 22. And then they'd be, I think, off the hook then. Okay. After that, although I'm, that's not clear, but the point is, it's doable. Then, yes, like if if you cut him uh, at if you cut him March first of two thousand twenty one, you are taking a massive hit. Like you are dead. Uh, if you trade him post June first, it's doable. It's not perfect, but if I can w- work out the parameters of a trade and again get let's say a fifth round pick in two thousand twenty two, I'm taking that. It's actually 
if San Francisco would bite on that, and if you have a quarterback in mind who you can draft, it's very workable. That yeah, part it's of all it. very interesting. Like it's because San Francisco is in a spot where you look at that team, it's they're a little bit like where the Vikings were at in 2008. Their path to get there was different because they actually like went deep, made a playoff run. But where you look at their roster when everyone's healthy and you're thinking, man, if they just had like a dude at quarterback, they're going to win the Super Bowl. That's kind of where the Vikings were 12 years ago. Just the incredible thing in about that, though, is is if you are, and I, I know that Kyle loves Kirk, but if you are the Niners franchise, right? Haven't you seen enough by now to like know what Kirk is capable of? I mean, Kirk is Kirk will be the ultimate tease. Y- you'd think so. And like but, he'll and- take you down that path. And you'll never get the rose. But th- but that's where ego comes in. I mean, you know, coaches and I know coaches in these sports, especially football, think, boy, if I get my hands on it. Remember, so uh, on the baseball side, right. Don Cooper got fired this week as the White Sox uh, pitching former coach. Twins Long pitcher. Time pitching I saw him coach. pitch for the Twins once. And Francisco Liriano was this broken down five and a half ERA, couldn't throw a strike pitcher in like 2011 or whatever it was. And the Twins just sold low on him. They traded him for a bag of baseball. Actually, they traded him for Eduardo Escobar. Yeah. So they actually got a, a good player in return. And Don Cooper went on the radio and said, we see some things in Francisco's delivery that uh, we think we can tweak and turn him around to be a stud pitcher again. And he wasn't. Like, But that's the way that some of these guys think. Kyle Shanahan probably looks at Kirk and says, I've worked with him before. I helped mold him to be a starting quarterback. And if we could just get him in here, we could get him out of the Mike Zimmer defensive environment, right? Where he's like, well, it's not like Kirk is being set up to thrive under a Mike Zimmer led team. Let's Kyle, be honest. And Kyle and Kirk probably talk a lot too. And my guess, my guess is, is that in conversations with Kirk, it's never Kirk's fault. And my guess is boy, Kirk is very. This, boy, and just, my yeah. guess is Kirk is very good at convincing you it's not my fault. And so yeah, I bet you they talk a lot, and I bet you that Kirk pines for for the days of Kyle. You were so good, and you did this and that, and Gary doesn't understand me like you did. But so the problem here, the where this trade gets gummed up a bit, is John Lynch, because John Lynch is a pretty smart football guy. And my guess, so if Kyle had control of San Francisco's fifty three man roster, I think what we're talking about right now could really happen. I think John Lynch might get in front of those tracks and be like, Kyle, well, sorry, dude. Two other things to consider, though, here, just to give to give Kirk some credit here, too. If if Kirk Cousins went to go play for Kyle Shanahan, Kirk Cousins would be, like, as good as he can, whatever whatever his peak capability is as a quarterback, he would reach it with Kyle Shanahan. Might be last year, to be honest. I think there's, there's a lot. Honestly, I, well, that's a good point, because Kevin Stefanski is showing what he can do in Cleveland right now. I so. swear to God, I didn't know. No, it's. I didn't know. That was all case. Gary. I was wrong. Um, but then the other question for San Francisco would be if you've moved off Jimmy Garoppolo, the, the, there's certainly nobody else on your roster right now that you're dying to put in there for a potential Super Bowl run. What are your options? Well, you could draft a quarterback mid to late first round, but there's no guarantees that that guy's going to help you win a Super Bowl in 2020. So it's it, it's kind of the same conundrum that the Vikings had going into 2018, which is all right. Well, we want to level up here, but we like what are our options? Right. Play the sounder again because it just hit me how how you could do this. This one. Reckless. Yes, so much reckless speculation. Double shot. So right. much reckless. Stereo. It's like we're at FM That's for a right. second. <laughs> okay. How about this? You pick up the option on Kirk in in March before the league year begins because you have to. All right. You are in talks with San Francisco about a very favorable trade as far as compensation. I'll take a sixth round pick. I'll take a seventh round pick. I'll take a ham sandwich. Okay. Now you get to the draft and you let's say you're drafting what's reasonable eighth, seventh, because the Vikings aren't, they're yeah, not going to win two or three games. They're not, they're, they're going to, they're going to go five and 11 or something. Yeah. So let's say you drafted eighth or something. Okay. You know, you're going to trade Kirk. Like you've got this worked out. Kyle's going to get his guy. Kyle gets his man. This is where you do what I said, which is you do whatever you have to do to get up in the draft. Like you've told the Wills, we have to do like, this is what's going to work. We're going to we're going to draft one of the top two quarterbacks in this draft and have that guy sign for five years. Um, salary cap implications go to go out the window. Not a problem now. Love it. I love this. I'm going to be giving up Ziggy Mark. It's Rick. I'm going to be giving up more compensation than I'm comfortable with doing. But we have to do it. We absolutely have to. So you know what? We're not going to have 25 draft picks. 
this year. I'm sorry about that. But we had 15 last year. But we had so 15 last Exactly. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm getting up in that draft to get one of those top two guys. And we're going to have our quarterback. Reckless speculation. And the day I draft that QB, there are going to be questions about, but you have Kirk. What about Kirk? What about, and quietly, I have worked out this trade, which will probably leak out, but that's fine. I love Your this. Thoughts. And I think the way you sell it to ownership in a way that doesn't incriminate you for being like incompetent <laughs> in some way, like, because you have to, you have to sell it to ownership in a way that says, Hey, I know this has been kind of a train wreck year in which we went five and 11 and I want to bail on my starting quarterback that I picked out in free agency. But, but here's why this is the right move. You can frame it just like the San Antonio Spurs did in the late 90s, just like the Golden State Warriors did this year. Hey, we just had so many injuries. My God, Daniil Hunter was out. Yeah. Oh, I'm with you on this and one. And we, you know, that's the biggest one. Michael Pierce Anthony opted Barr, out. Michael Pierce. Which I mean, was responsible on, of Michael to do. Offense showed some signs of life, but how are we supposed to, how are we supposed to hold a team under four touchdowns with three of our most important defensive players out, right? Like, and we all knew that this was a transition year with the cornerbacks, but those guys learned a lot. We trust them going forward. This was a take your lumps year. This was just a fluke season for a million different reasons. And we feel like we should take advantage of our positioning. Yes. We don't, we don't really get the opportunity to be, you know, drafting between five and 10. Yes. Let's take advantage of it. We drafted 15 rookies last. We got plenty of rookies We're, and we'll, we can still have a six round pick in there, but let's make the play. Let's get that franchise quarterback, Mark, Ziggy, you guys, you got booby. You guys have been longing for, you took over in Dante Culpepper. You thought maybe he was going to come back from a knee injury. You've been looking for this franchise quarterback for a long time. Yes. This is the shot and it's a bounce back roster. That's going to be healthy again. And five years of cornerbacks with experience and five years of control contractually. Reckless speculation. And Kyle gets his man. This all seems very perfect. I like it. It all seems very perfect. Lean into this. And Vikings fans. You know, I got a feeling Kirk and San Fran, it's a perfect match. The West Coast laid back. Pressure sort of off a little bit. I think he'd probably grow a beard out there. It's not. I, I think yeah, he'd, that's he'd fine. Wear some flannel but I'm, shirts. I'm just saying, I, I think Kirk on the West Coast really fits. Yeah. I got one more question before we get to our pigskin pecking order for you guys, too. All right. That's right. The part B to this whole conversation. What if the Vikings had chosen an alternative path in 2018? If they had said, all right, man, we could go sign Kirk, but boy, the chemistry we have with Case Keenum or the, the tantalizing what could have been with Teddy Bridgewater. What do you think if, if the if the Vikings had stuck with Case Keenum like a lot of people wanted? Now, he has been mostly terrible as a starter in Denver since then, as a starter in Washington. He's a backup now in Cleveland. But, in fact, he's mostly just been terrible everywhere he's played in his career, except for Minnesota in that one year. It was very predictable what happened to Case Keenum. Yep. But a lot of people would say, yes, predictable if he goes to these other places, but but they had the magic. They had the... Sure. He had the connection with Diggs. Diggs sure. probably doesn't want a trade if if Case Keenum's still around. What happens if they keep Case Keenum? If they sign Keenum to like a two year contract, you know, would he still be the quarterback? Would they be winning? No, I think I think that that uh, Case was forced to turn in his his uh, glass slipper during the conference title game against Philadelphia. I think that was the end. I really do. It was a magical ride. It was great fun. The Saints game, people will recall forever but no i think that that was destined to end ugly because and it was just a flash it was so the only one that i have a question about is what if you had what if you had kept teddy and he could i don't think he could have played immediately started but gotten a bridge quarterback to replace him wow. like have him behind a bridge qb pun intended and then i didn't even mean it that way but anyway um cuz i mean that's plausible and i don't blame the vikings for what they did. And at the time I defended and will still defend the cousins signing back then. But the Bridgewater scenario is actually doable. If you had thought to yourself, well, he's not there yet knee wise, but he's going to be eventually here. And we like him a lot. He's a good guy. We're going to keep him, and we're going to get a quarterback to start. Who's basically going to step in for case. If, if you had to in 2018, uh, but 2019, we're going to pull the trigger again on Teddy. 
I think that's I think that's a discussion. Yeah, the, it, it, it's tantalizing now because you're looking over there. The Panthers were like the Panthers were supposed to flirt with the number one overall pick, and this was supposed to be just a complete reset year. And I will take a flyer on this Teddy guy. You know, Cam, Cam was out, so they they took a flyer on Teddy. So basically, without Christian McCaffrey, like McCaffrey played what a game and a half or something. Mm-hmm. They're three and two. They've been one of the surprise teams in the NFL. And Teddy, at age 28, he's only 28 years old still. He's been in the NFL for like seven years. He's only 28 or wow. six years or something. Wowza. And and he's doing Teddy things. He's accurate. He's avoiding the big negative plays. And he's winning games. He's just he's yeah. basically won twice as many games as he has lost as a starter in the NFL. He's gotten tangibles. And he's not and he's had some decent pieces around him, but it's not like it's not like Teddy with the Vikings in the early Zimmer era and Teddy with Carolina here. It's not like he's been working with the you know, the 2007 Patriots roster here, and he's still winning a lot of games. That's the one that I still look at and just think, man, that's that's the what-if scenario. But it would have been very risky coming off a year in which the Vikings went to the doorstep of a home Super Bowl to say, well, yeah, I we're going to run, run it back. And we would have ripped them if it didn't work. And it probably, w- it probably would have shipwrecked them in 2018. If Case Keenum turns into a pumpkin and Bridgewater wasn't ready to start again yes. in 2018, yes. they would have had an even worse fall from the 2017 season. And people probably get fired at that point. The real question is this. What if Bradford in 2017 does not get hurt? The knee does not go. Bradford was a solid quarterback. Because he, because that that's the one, that's the most, I think, realistic discussion. Because Case was going to be done. I'm sorry. It was fun, but it was a, it was a football one night stand. Okay. He's gone. Bridgewater is an interesting discussion, but it's a difficult one. Like that guy's knee blew up and you're going to bring him back, but you're not going to start him. But if Bradford doesn't go down against the Saints, and let's just say he keeps playing, I think Sam Bradford is still your starting quarterback right now. Yeah, I have a hard time even envisioning that scenario because he's just never healthy. Yeah. So it's it's hard to even speculate. I mean, are you saying hurt without getting hurt? On the Case Keenum one night stand thing, are you saying that like you had a great one night stand and, and in the morning Case goes, uh, so I. Uh, I, I'd I'd love to hang out again. Can I get your number? And you're like, no, you know what it no. was? Or you give him a fake number? Not uh, a fake number. Or do you no. just tell him you no? Didn't, he didn't spur him. Let's just let this be. Case what it Keenum. Was. Case Keenum fits the Mackie and Judd description perfectly of quarterback beer goggles. <laughs> like it was that one. It was like I I have never met someone who's most so much beautiful, fun. Most beautiful you're quarterback unbe- I've ever you're seen. Unbelievable. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, you're just great. And the next day you're like, oh my god, what was I thinking? The, the next day you creep his Facebook profile and you're like, oh, what was that? Oh, what happened in Texas there? Yeah. Houston. Was interesting. That's Case Keenum. God bless him. Nice guy. I don't know. Hard to, hard to criticize the Vikings too much for the path they chose in It's the extension on Cousins that bothers me, not the original contract. Yep. I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen, before we bolt here, let's fly through a pigskin pecking order. Football. All right. We, uh, we had our, our Tuesday night game under the belt last night. The Titans, without practicing ever, beat I love the hell Tuesday out of the night Bills. Football. I am all in. Bring it bring it on. Tuesday night football. It is better than Thursday night football. It is. It is. And it gives you more time to prepare. Like, you, like you don't have the... You're not going to have three days prep for a Thursday game. It would make a lot logistical sense, in my opinion, to move it to Tuesdays. It's I the cherry totally on top. Agree. It's the cherry on top of the football weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, it was fun watching that last night. Let's start with Judd Zolgad. Pigskin packing order your top 10 teams in the NFL going into this next week. All right, 10 uh, to 1. Actually, I'll start with who I left out of the uh, pecking order for this week. Out, Tampa Bay. Out, only because of your guy at quarterback. Phillip Rivers and the Colts are out. Oh, my God, yeah. is he bad. Number 10. Yeah, he, yeah, he's, he's shot. My guy. Number 10. Full disclosure, a team that I meant to put in last week, and I just plain forgot because I'm <laughs> old and feeble. The Patriots are back in. They're two and two, but I shouldn't have dropped them out completely. That was not fair. I just forgot. Patriots are number 10. Dropping from four to nine after what I saw last night. Um, boy, the quarterback didn't look like an MVP last night. The Buffalo Bills. Four and one now, but um, yeah, they look like they had been off for two weeks, not the Tennessee Titans. Number eight. Holding firm after beating uh, Washington 30-10, to 10, the Los Angeles Rams. N- number seven, not ranked previously. because And I didn't buy into what I saw against the Vikings, but they looked darn good last night. The Titans, four and rip. They looked really good. Mm-hmm. Number six, 
Moving up from number nine uh, at four and one, they just beat the Colts in part because, unfortunately for Phil, Philip River stinks. The Cleveland Browns and Kevin Stefanski, number six, number five, going up one spot. Uh, th- they had a bye. They play the Buccaneers this weekend, the Green Bay Packers. Number four, the Pittsburgh Steelers, who beat the Eagles and look to be legit to me, big time, up from five. Number three, holding firm, Baltimore. Number two, five and rip, Seattle. I can't put them one because that defense, I just can't do it. And until they get beat again, I'm going to just leave the Chiefs at number one, despite their loss to the um, to the Las Vegas Raiders at four and one. So I go Kansas City, wow. Seattle, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Green Bay, wow. Cleveland, Tennessee, L.A. Rams, Buffalo, and the Patriots. All right, Declan Goff. All right, uh, a new entrance to number 10, Teddy Bridgewater and the Carolina Panthers. Wow. They have entered my power rankings, wow. baby. Football. Yeah, that makes sense. After going 0 and 2, Teddy, hey Teddy, Teddy is you come to my birthday on pace for career highs across the board. He is the high school sweetheart who died on prom night, but um, and wow, I'm, I'm, I'm he's looking not at dead. Him, and you left me at prom, but oh, he's um, very much alive. Oh, he but left he's very you. Very much alive. He left with your and best friend, thriving with my best friend. So yes, yeah. um, my worst nightmare my is coming true before my eyes. Mine. Thanks, Theodore. Appreciate it. Uh, number nine, the Tennessee Titans. Uh, even though they are undefeated, I, I, they have played one less game. And I hate their attitude, by the way, after last week's I agree last with night's you. game. I agree. Taylor Lewin, right? God, just a bunch of tried to be like, dude. yeah, what what was that all about? I can't stand it. You spread the vid. So a little bit of that has some uh, personal reluctance there. Uh, number eight, the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland Browns are still looking pretty good. Hmm. Um, Baker Mayfield, although hasn't played perfect, Kevin Stefanski is cooking up something nice there. So they're number eight for me. The Bills fall to the number seven after their loss to the Titans. I believe they had them in my top five last week, but they're seven. L.A. Rams at six. We keep sleeping on the Rams, and they just keep quietly behind us just winning games, and I'm very impressed with what the Rams have done. Number five, the Baltimore Ravens. Ravens, I'm going to drop them off a little bit because I think these four teams ahead of them have proven more in the short term. So the Ravens are five because I have the Steelers Number four, and I know the Eagles made a little bit of a comeback, but the Steelers have also kind of like they're the AFC version. I think of the Rams. We all slept on them. Dude, NFC, they're NFC, very good. Air, AFC North, man, it's the best division in football. You've got three really good four win teams, and then you've got the maybe the best young quarterback prospect on the one and three and one team. No kidding. Uh, I have the Chiefs number three. The Kansas mm. City Chiefs are number three after their loss to the Vegas Raiders. Um, Derek Carr looked awesome, man. And I, I, I'm i I'm very close to putting the Raiders in here, but I have my uh, personal love to Teddy over Derek Carr. So that's why the Panthers made it and the Raiders did not. Number two, the Seattle Seahawks after their victorious win over the Vikings. They are number two, and the Packers are still number one. So 10 through one, Panthers, Titans, Browns, Bills, Rams, Ravens, Steelers, Chiefs, Seahawks, Green Bay Packers still holding number one for two weeks. All right. I've got the Raiders jumping into my 10 for the first time this season. You you beat the Chiefs like that, and your offense looks like that. John Gruden took a lot of flack early on for, like, what, what, what's this caricature of John Gruden doing back yeah, in the uh, Raiders? He deserved it at the time. And he has put together an explosive offense. He's getting the best out of Derek Carr, so the Raiders are 10th. I got the Buffalo Bills at 9. I'm not dinging them too much. That's Whatever, like it was a Tuesday night game. <laughs> the Titans were all full of piss and vinegar. Um, that stiff arm by Derrick Henry was was aggressive. I've got the Titans at eight, so they're jumping into my ten here. A really nondescript team, but they just punch teams in the mouth and they and they win a lot of games. Tannehill looked good last night. He did. Yep. Rams number seven for all the reasons Declan mentioned. Super under the radar. People sort of wrote him off after a down year last year, but the Rams are very well coached. They have a really good defensive front. Buccaneers, I'm leaving at six. Steelers, five. Mm-hmm. Chiefs at four now for me. They just look like, the wheels aren't off by any means, but they just look they look like zombies. A little hangover. Don't, don't, It'll sleep, change. On, don't sleep on the machine. Not yeah. sleeping on them. Not sleeping, don't sleep on the machine, boys. A little hungover. Just, just bumping them to four for a minute. <laughs> Get the Ravens at three. Seahawks. It's really Russell Wilson that's ranked number yeah, two. I was going to say Correct. that defense is so bad, it's impossible for me to put them number one. Have they lost a game yet? They've got one of the greatest quarterbacks of they all tri- time. They tried hard, and he wouldn't let them, yeah. He's ridiculous. Yeah, no question. It's, it's, I mean, the, it reminds me a little bit of the Chiefs last year in that their defense was rickety for a long time, and they would fall behind in these games, and Pat Mahomes just hulked up, and that's Russell Wilson. And then number one, the best team in the NFL, sorry, Vikings fans, the Packers are ridiculous this season so far. And Aaron Rodgers I want to see the Packers to play tougher teams. I really want to see and the Packers play tougher teams. They'll, that's they play the Buccaneers this weekend. Interesting. 
Yep, they play the Buccaneers this weekend. No Bears for all of us. No Chicago Bears. Darn, sorry, can't do it. They're what? They're four and one. It's hilarious. Yeah, it's. I just don't believe either. Have you ever seen a, a winning record Bears team and thought that's a legitimate team right there? Well, that yeah, Bears yeah, team. a few times. No, two years ago, <laughs> that defense was damn good. I mean, this no. defense is good, but I just can't do it. I can't buy into it. Yeah, they're Trubisky frauds. and Foles. I can't. They're frauds. So Packers, Seahawks, Ravens, Chiefs, Steelers, Buccaneers, All Rams, right. Titans, Bills, Raiders. And that's a wrap on this episode of Purple Daily with Mackie and Judd and Declan. And uh, we will see you guys tomorrow again.